So I'm going to talk a little bit about my technique for repair posterior shoulder instability. Is the posterior just the other side of anterior? And the reality is it's not. We have to think about posterior instability. Just Emilio showed us it's much different. So posterior, the labrum behaves much differently. First of all, there's more flaps, more cracks, more buckets, and this tissue here is just weaker. This type of appearance does not generally happen in anterior standard bank heart injuries. Well, tear type matters. Just like we've shown, ALPSA is not as good if you have that for anterior instability. If you have a bucket or if you have a Kim lesion, those outcomes are not as good based on tear. As we published this in 19, just tear type matters, especially posteriorly, whether you have more of a bucket handle or a flap. The shoulder capsule is much different anteriorly versus posteriorly. We know that anterior capsule is actually two, three millimeters thick, and that posterior capsule, though, is much weaker. And just as was shown, that's probably why the muscles and the scapular dynamic stabilizers are so much more important because this posterior capsule is a lot weaker, and it's just the inherent static stabilizers of the shoulder are much different. As was shown, it can be often missed. It's vague shoulder pain. You have a 23-year-old. I can't do as many push-ups, can't do bench press. Uh, injections in the subacromial space is a classic. They don't help. Voluntary versus involuntary, we talked about. But this is someone, he doesn't really like it. He's kind of shrugging it off. Um, and this is a very common type of positional instability where surgery is much better outcomes, whereas this more at the side in the classic voluntary is not as good. So what are the risk factors? Brett Owens looked at this. It's actually a pretty cool study where he did a bunch of MRIs on, uh, on college kids that came into West Point and then did them and saw and how they did overall. And when you did all these MRIs, the baseline testing showed that glenoid version, height, and depth of the rotator interval were the biggest risk factors, including glenoid retroversion, for actually developing posterior instability. Now, if we have findings of dysplasia, subluxation, Gilles Walsh, and others have told us we may not be able to fix this with a repair no matter what, so you want to be careful about that. And so what we're looking for here is this is an arthrogram image. You can see a very clear posterior tear. You can see right below that the classic tear findings posteriorly. And you can also sometimes see this very patulous capsule. And so there's a wide variety of pathology in terms of how these patients are behaving and what you see. When we looked at the difference between anterior versus posterior instability, we had 100 anteriors and 100 posteriors. What do these patients look like? Anterior, mostly they have a dislocation. They have a subluxation. Posterior instability, most of them said, well, I did a bunch of benching. I did a lot of lifting. I had an injury playing football or wrestling. But the uh, outcomes were overall pretty reasonable once they were repaired arthroscopically with a matched cohort. What about bone loss? There are major differences here. We talked about the capsule, labrum tear, but really the difference is when you start to get these attritional bone injuries or other problems posteriorly, it's just not the same as anterior. It's not the cliff, and when you, when you looked at this, it's average of about 40 degree angle relative to the axis of the glenoid, whereas anteriorly, it's almost 90 degrees, and so when you're looking at how to potentially reconstruct these and whether you're doing a repair, uh, JT, others, and we have shown also, guess what, right around 15% of posterior loss of that surface area, might not, you might have a slope there, but loss of that normal glen glenoid concavity, we, we found a 25 times higher failure rate if you had that posterior bone loss. So there may be something with posterior bone loss that's even worse than anterior bone loss. And so this is the type of thing we're seeing. It's not the same as anterior. The lo location of the de defect is different. And the uh, outcomes are also based on bony width, was predictor of poor outcome. Glenoid bone loss also correlated with direction of bone loss. When you look at uh, our work as well as Bradley's work, the uh, direction is just not the same as anterior. And then guess what? Smaller glenoid width and percent glenoid bone loss continues to be associated with failure, especially in posterior. Here's uh, an article we just, uh, just have in press currently looking at anterior versus posterior grafts and how to fashion these. And the key point is anterior is almost a 90 degree angle. On average, it's about 88 degrees. And posterior was about 40 degrees. And these are the differences you can see here in terms of fashioning your bone graft when you're doing anterior versus posterior in terms of the morphology of the glenoid neck. And our defects, when we looked at them, bone loss was correlated very well with the overall outcome. So how do we treat this? In general, uh, arthroscopic, and we're going to do this 
And we looked at our patients from here, most of these were in San Diego in 2005. This was actually one of the largest studies in literature, believe it or not, back in 2005. We found pretty good overall outcomes. It wasn't perfect, but they were pretty good overall outcomes and got patients back. And now I'm going knotless for all of these, lower profile, more consistent tensioning, better way to restore this. Uh, I'll finish up with a case and sort of how we do this is an NFL professional football player at a subluxation event, blocking a player, tackling, tried to get back to do stuff, had re-injury and just pain with continued loaded internal rotation and flexion. Here's the classic findings. We have the scope uh, anterior superior. The probe is from the mid-glenoid portal, so we're probing posteriorly and you can see here's uh, some of the uh, area of damage. Uh, this is the treatment plan we generally look at. These are uh, tape type sutures and you can see how we're going to put this in, especially with a posterior uh, lateral type of portal. And that seven o'clock portal that uh, Tony showed us very well is the same thing we use. Uh, it's almost like doing a remplissage posteriorly, but just looking at the overall uh, bank art lesion posteriorly, not necessarily the remplissage. Thank you very much.